Welcome back to another edition of Cover One Buffalo. This is another uh, episode of uh, you know the premium subscription. We want you to go ahead and subscribe to our website, CoverOne.net, to get these little tidbits, these little behind-the-scenes uh, footage of you know us kind of you know going back and forth between um, camp, uh, training camp, mini camps. Uh, we just want to give you our opinions on things. I know you guys are looking for any type of content related to the Bills. So Aaron Quinn and I are bringing you a quick episode today. Aaron, what's going on, brother? Oh, nothing, man. Just uh, killing the time between now and training camp. You know. No, definitely. And you know, I want to get right into it uh, as far as uh, mini camps go. It's wrapped up now. So. Uh, what were some of your takeaways coming out? Obviously, we're not on scene there, but what were some of your takeaways from you know from the media and uh, minicamp altogether? Yeah, sure. Like you said when we were offline here a second ago, I, I think it starts at quarterback. There was a lot of uh, back and forth day to day. I think it's super interesting uh, since none of us know what the process is for how they want to develop Josh Allen. Uh, not only Josh Allen, but also developing the newcomer, A.J. McCarron from free agency. And then, uh, you know, like Nate wrote about, did we write off Nathan Peterman too soon? And what does the coaching staff think of him? And I think that's st- all starting to play out before our eyes, which is exciting to watch. Yeah. And when it comes to the quarterback competition, you know, it, it seems like every day there was some. A uh, new surprise coming out of camp, whether it was Peterman shining one day, Allen shining another. We haven't really heard too much about McCarron. He seems to kind of be the third guy when it comes to media reports, but that's to be expected, um, you know, being the veteran of that quarterback room uh, and, and really not being that flashy of a player altogether. He's not a guy that's going to wow you with his physical abilities, but he's also, um, you know, he plays with that type of mentality where uh, he's not going to lose you a game. So to hear him kind of uh, be, you know, in the shadows, I'm not surprised about that. But um, it is, you know, it's a it's a quarterback competition, and so you're going to hear about someone else, um, you know, doing well uh, each day. So um, that doesn't surprise me. But um, it seemed like camp ended with Josh Allen kind of lighting it up and almost rallying the team on that touchdown to uh, uh, Austin Prohl. Uh, to end mini camps. So, what are your thoughts on that and and uh, Allen's performance uh, according to reports? Yeah, I I think that it's his, what we expected, right? He was going to show off some great arm strength, make some throws that the other guys just can't make. Uh, we saw that, but he still was making some mistakes. Uh, the thing that I liked the report about him running over to Micah Hyde after an interception, and t- you know, tell me what you saw there. Um, it seems like he's a guy that really wants to learn. Shady had mentioned that he's all about football, almost to a fault. That's a great thing that you want to see in a rookie. And the thing that really has been standing out to me is the veterans that are talking about him and that it's a very unique quarterback competition, something that we one that we haven't seen in Buffalo, even though we've seen quite a bit of quarterback competitions, is that uh, there's no vet that has really proven a lot in the league at any uh, spot that he's been in. And Josh Allen's coming in and really earning respect from the vets uh, right out of the gate in OTA. So I think that's a great sign uh, for Bills fans. Whether or not he gets to start week one, I, I just think it's a nice sign that he's already come in and within the first week earning that respect. Yeah, and I mean, that respect, uh, some of the kindest words came from a guy that's been in the league a long time and a guy that's going to play hand-in-hand with whatever quarterback starts, and that's LaShawn McCoy. Um, he, you know, he was very honest and candid about um, rookies and how he doesn't normally like them, but that what he sees in Allen, you know, Allen has, a, he, to him, Allen has a chance to be special. I mean, whether it's this year or years down the line, who knows? But to hear that type of talk from a guy like LaShawn McCoy, um, that's got to be something that Bills fans have uh, kind of, I don't know, attached themselves to and, and, and like to hear because, again, we, we took a big chance on this guy in top 10, uh, being a top 10 pick. So uh, it was good to hear, like you said, veterans talking uh, and, and talking good things about uh, the young quarterback. But you got to give some credit to, you know, Peterman, too, because, I mean, Peterman, he's still battling and he's got a big stigma to overcome because, you know, sure. he, he really... He really struggled, you know, over on the left coast last year, and uh, I think he he has that chip on his shoulder, uh, not because of a fifth round pick last year, but because now he's got to overcome that stigma of, you know, really just not showing up um, over uh, over in the west coast, which obviously wasn't all his fault, right, Ern? 
Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, us as fans tend to just poke fun at that because it's an easy target, but uh, definitely a lot to overcome. And I think McDermott talked about it quite a bit in the DNA. And, you know, we laugh at all the things coach says because it's all coach speak or whatever. But there's clearly something to that because it doesn't seem to have affected him. He went uh, by all accounts. He went into the offseason and just worked really hard to uh, continue to develop. And for a fifth round pick, you can't expect a lot for him to come in right away. He is a developmental quarterback. So uh, it is nice to see that the development's paying off and you're, you're seeing that on the field early here in the OTA process. Um, one thing I want to point out, too, for uh, the premium members that are listening and if this goes out to non-premium members at any point is right now in the Slack channel, our friend uh, Mike Crow just asked a question. We're not live, but he was asking a question. So that's another benefit here of joining the Cover One uh, premium is you get in here and it pops up to all of us. So I'll, I'll address this question here while we're, we're I got you it's here. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, he says, let's say at the end of camp, McCarron is number three on the depth chart. Do we roll with three quarterbacks or is he cut? What are your thoughts there, man? Ooh, that's a great question. And he usually has some really good questions in the selection, yeah. along with our other premium subscribers. Uh, you know, I, I would still roll with three. I mean, in, in this day and age, um, you know, having that veteran uh, in the locker room, even if he is number three, that's probably would be his best role if he doesn't um, secure even the second spot because uh, he's seen – a lot, you know, and he's seen it from the, the the role of a backup. So if he isn't, you know, say they don't dress him, he's in street clothes. He's the type of guy that you'd want holding that clipboard and, and you know being side by side with the offense coordinator and the QB coaches and those uh, young QBs. So I, I I don't think he'll be cut. If he did, I mean, I'm not going to be surprised either because I mean, obviously this regime has a plan. And if there's anything that we um, have learned from day one of Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean is that they have a process. They have a, yeah, you know, they want to develop and they have a plan. So uh, I think we can always fall back on that, Aaron. I know you and I both do uh, more times than not trust the process, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think right now uh, the process is to have three. Uh, whether or not, obviously, they're all on the game day roster is left to be unknown. But like you said, I, I've always been a fan of having a vet in that QB room, whether or not he's playing or suiting up. Um, it's just nice for the players. I know people think, hey, these are all professionals, but sometimes there's guys that are scared to ask questions to the coach because they think it's a dumb question and the coach is going to get on them. I don't know if that's the case in the Buffalo QB room, but I think it's always nice to have veterans that the other players can talk to because it, it's just like any other job. It's easier to talk to your coworkers than it is your boss sometimes. Definitely. And, you know, McDermott, uh, before practice yesterday, had mentioned um, the wide receiver position and the battles that are going on. And, and I know that a lot of fans are still worried about the depth and still worried even about the top end talent at the position. Uh, obviously, the organization doesn't really feel that way. And we shouldn't be surprised based on where, you know, Brandon Bean and McDermott came from over Carolina. I don't, I don't believe that they – they need, you know, a top tier talent receiver. Would they like to have one? Absolutely. But I think the value at that of that position, um, they put it on the quarterback and and you know developing that quarterback and having a quarterback that can obviously distribute the ball around, uh, a la Cam Newton. But when we talk about the receivers here, who are some names that stood out to you uh, so far in Phase One and Phase Two of this offseason? Yeah, I think the thing that I saw that really was interesting to me is some of the reports of Benjamin looking healthy and looking a little bit leaner. And I think that fans are really sleeping on him, which is weird to me because he is the number one receiver on this depth chart here. Obviously, he's had a couple down years, but it's been plagued with injuries. If he can stay healthy and stay lean, I think he can get back to being a really good receiver. Uh, a lot of it's going to depend on the quarterback play. But that one really stood out to me. I mean, that could be a huge boost for this Bills uh, receiving core if he can get back to anywhere where he was in his, you know, first two years. Yeah, and a lot of, again, a lot of fans are worried about, you know, that number one wide receiver spot. And obviously Benjamin has probably the most talent and it's probably the biggest threat from in that, uh, you know, that meeting room. But I do believe that the slot position is really where um, this offense is going to be run through. You know, you're going to have your tight end and Charles Clay in that slot position. And I think, you know, the reports of Jeremy Curley just being that steady, um, uh, savvy veteran uh, from that position, I think he's pretty much locked down that position. But other guys that have stood out, not just in the slot position to me, uh, have been uh, Robert Foster, uh, the Alabama wide receiver, Um, you know, with his speed, with his skill set, with his knowledge of this scheme, all the reports coming out of camp um, that he's done really well and looked really good and has had, had a lot of snaps with the first and second teams uh, is not surprising to me, but I do think it is something to keep an eye on because uh, besides him, 
I mean, we the the Bills don't really have that deep threat. That they don't really have that guy that can win or separate with his physical uh, abilities, a la you know speed, uh, his his agility, you know, ba- being able to separate with his physical skills. So I think Foster's one of those guys. He's maybe a little on the lean side. Um, he's the type of guy that you're gonna want playing flanker, not um, not X, where you know Benjamin will line up on the line of scrimmage because you don't want him to get pressed, but. He's a guy that has the speed and abilities to separate, um, and so uh, that position is going to be important. And, and having a guy like him uh, on these three by one trip sets, solo wide receiver out to the field or into the boundary, either way, um, a guy that can win on isolation routes, they got to find that guy because the the three by one and trip sets are a set that are in every offensive playbook, and the Bills don't have a guy yet to be that ISO receiver. Benjamin's not that guy, so. Right. Uh, if Foster can step up and, and, and play opposite uh, Benjamin or opposite the three by one sets as an isolation receiver, I think that's a really good sign um, for the young guy. Yeah, I think it's going to be a super interesting group to watch this summer. Obviously, Zay is supposed to be ready when the training camp kicks off, but him being out in the OTAs gives some of those other guys a chance to get a look that maybe they otherwise wouldn't. Obviously, Brandon Riley got some uh, reps with the ones. Uh, and what was really interesting about that is you heard names like Foster and Riley. I didn't hear much about Malachi Dupree, which is a little disappointing to me because I wanted to see him make that push with Brandon Riley and compete sure. with him. Uh, but I also didn't really hear much about Andre Holmes. So I'm guessing that he's kind of sliding down the depth chart while a lot of the, these other guys are rising it. Uh, you did hear some good things about Rod Streeter, so I, th- I think it's going to be a really fun competition to watch all summer long. No doubt about it. So let's go ahead and flip to the defensive side. So uh, it seems like uh, you know it's been it's been really uh, a really good camp so far for the defense. From speaking with Jordan Poyer, he had mentioned that you know they've kind of picked up where they lo- left off uh, last season, which is always a good sign. Uh, and he even mentioned that they're, you know, they're starting to pick off some of these quarterbacks. So that's a good sign for the defense, not so much the offense, but again, it's mini camp. So, uh, they're seeing these plays in 11 on 11s and then into practice time. So they're going to get a key, uh, on the offense, uh, pretty well. And usually this time of the year, uh, the defense is always, um, looking better than the offense, especially right. this year when you got a new coordinator. So, um, talk about maybe some of the guys that are banged up on the defensive side and what you've heard on that side of the ball. Yeah, I think it's a little disappointing, but understandable that Milano has not been active. Uh, Hamstrings are tough. I'd rather him just get that out of the way before we get into the hot summer uh, training camp. You know, those things can linger, like McDermott said. Let's just get him right because he's not competing for a job. But it'd be nice to see him building some of that uh, with Edmonds and some of the new pieces on defense, building that communication level. But I'm sure they're working on that behind closed doors. Um, so Edmonds was a tough one. I, I want to know really what's going on with Trent Murphy. He was wearing the red jersey the whole time. Big unknown for me. We just talked about the defensive line on the podcast last week. Uh, didn't really have much to say about him because I don't know how they're going to use him, what they're going to do. But uh, I think there's some interesting battles on that side of the ball. You can't take a lot from defense uh, in OTAs because obviously the the lines aren't interacting. There's no pads and stuff. So very interested to watch what's going on this summer there. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed to hear about Milano. I mean, it is a soft tissue injury with a hammy and whatnot. But um, I would like to see him out there because, I mean, like you and all Bills fans, I, I, we want him to have a, a bigger role this year. Um, having him and Edmonds in the lineup will open up this defensive playbook, as I've mentioned before, and just allow the defense to be more balanced. Um, you know, and, and coverages specifically because last year that's one thing this defense um, didn't have was athleticism at that second uh, level, which kind of limits your you know coverage on the back end. Which is, I mean, don't get me wrong, our, our, the the defensive secondary is top notch. It's probably one of the top five in the league when you're looking from all you know all of the positions. But uh, you can't rely on them all the time. You're gonna have you know need linebackers that can cover some space, obviously in this, you know, especially in the cover three looks that we ran the most last year. So uh, having Milano and Edmonds in that uh, linebacker um, crew is, is definitely going to help this defense. And uh, as Poyer also mentioned to me, you know, they're going to be able to build upon the stuff they did last year. So while they had a successful year in the secondary last year, you know, this year with the linebacking uh, group that they have now, if healthy, I mean, they can do so much more and become even more opportunistic and, you know, put those guys in the secondary even in better positions to make plays, which is uh, something that, you know, when you look back, it's it's pretty amazing that the run that they had um, last season. 
Yeah, absolutely. And but like we said with the Zay Jones injury, uh, the Milano being out does give Humber a chance to really get back in. He had a nice start to the year. Uh, fans weren't super impressed with the way the season finished for him when he was was playing. But I think he's going to have some time on the field this year. So it's OK for in my mind for him to get in OTAs and just really get a feel, maybe redevelop uh, after his, you know, he had that injury and just kind of slid off after that. And maybe he can regain some of his early season success. No doubt about it, man. So uh, is there anything else that stood out on the defensive side of the ball besides, obviously, some of the injuries, some of the guys that missed out, uh, maybe some reports that came out uh, from the defense? Well, I was expecting to hear a little bit more about, you know, I know uh, McDermott had mentioned a little bit about Philip Gaines playing inside outside. I was expecting maybe to hear any about like competition at that position of the slot um and and what's happening outside of your main defensive backs and i didn't get much as far as a rotation there or anything like that so it leaves me a little bit of concern and that's something i'm going to be looking for in training camp because it's a long season it's a marathon season and somebody's going to go down at some point and i kind of want to know you know what that depth chart behind the starters looks like and if they're a formidable group you know that's a great uh, topic because it's something that we even talked about with our subscribers in the slack channel is the slot corner position because you and I are both big fans of Leonard Johnson. And while he doesn't have the physical stature that you uh, typically want in a corner in today's day and age, um, he was very steady. You know, he obviously knew the defense really well, uh, really, you know, big in the communication aspect of the coverages um, last season, and a a great tackler from that position, Um, not just corners on the outside, but the slot position has to be even, you know, a better tackler. Um, in right. this defense because they're always going to be right on the fringe of the box. And so, you know, this is the one position, the one role that I am tremendously worried about because it's obviously in our division when you think about uh, the Patriots and what they do from the slot position. When you think about um, what the Dolphins are going to be doing with the slot position with Danny Amendola now, um, a, a lot of these teams are going to start attacking us from that slot position. And uh, as we talked about in the Slack channel, um, the Bills were a heavy zone last year, and they're going to have to, you know, they're going to want to balance it out a little bit more to, to right. disguise and confuse quarterbacks. Because if you're going to just play zone against, you know, top ten, top fifteen quarterbacks, they're going to they're going to eat you apart. So, um, Philip Gaines uh, is a guy who struggled um, in coverage last year, and I'm not talking talking just giving up ten yard here or there. He was giving up chunks last year uh, and, and big plays, and that's something that the Bills were number one at last year is defending the deep ball, defending explosive plays. Um, so Philip Gaines, um, you know, his role, if he's a slot corner, which I don't think he is because he can't hang with those shifty, uh, you know, smaller slot receivers. Um, where does the rookie Johnson come in? Um, I mean, that's a big, that's a big ask of a rookie, right? Oh yeah. Big time. And McDermott did mention that Gaines has played on the outside. I think he said something to the effect of, you know, he had some time with varsity, uh, on the outside. So definitely, I think he sees what you're seeing too, in that maybe he struggled at times and, and maybe, you know, we know Davis has played in the slot. So maybe they're going to move some guys around, try to create a little confusion and mask some guys deficiencies. Uh, but I think it's going to be tough, uh, a tough ask for them. And, you know, maybe Leonard Johnson, he's still out there. So if Gaines is struggling, you know, the first uh, couple weeks of training camp, uh, maybe they bring back Johnson because it's, you know, the guy, you know, and you know, he's not going to make too many big mistakes. Uh, so I'd rather live with some catches as long as you know he's going to be there in the right position versus uh you know the high risk high reward guy no doubt about it so with that said we're going to wrap this up so aaron where can we find you on social media for sure it's uh, at aaron quinn 716 and uh wherever cover one's at i'm right behind them all right guys well again you can find all of our content on twitter on social all the social media platforms obviously find us at cover1.net Thanks for tuning in for this edition of Cover 1 Buffalo.